Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is Tuesday, May 18th, 2010, and our special guest tonight is Charles Fidel to talk about school architecture in the context of 21st century skills. Charles, welcome back. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure for me. I uh, really have enjoyed talking to you uh, both here in the interview series and in person. I'm looking forward to tonight. The Future of Education is sponsored by Illuminate, my employer, and the social network for educators that I work on called Learn Central. It's a free network for educators to connect, and it does have a, a free version of Illuminate baked in. So we hope that you'll come and take a look at that, learncentral.org. Coming up on the Future of Education, the Thursday night, two nights from now, Michael Furtick, one of the co-creators of Taking It Global, or Taking IT Global, uh, really should be a terrific show that night. Kathy Davidson next week on the Future of Thinking. Uh, you can see the rest of the schedule. Some of the new additions include David Wood on his new book, Getting Paid for Who You Are, as part of our look at uh, students and their own personal branding, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, Carol Dweck from Stanford on her book Mindset has signed up. Kathleen Cushman on Fires in the Mind, a book coming out uh, next month that uh, talks about student competencies from the student point of view. George Siemens, uh, Clarence Fisher, Paul, Paul Peterson on Saving Schools, um, and lots of other fun guests uh, in the Waiting in the Wings. We'll enjoy letting you know about them. If you've missed a session, they are all recorded at futureofeducation.com. Uh, I had to reboot the server today, so if you tried to get a recording recently and it wasn't up, it was probably because the server was down. Please do uh, look at our Students 2.0 project with Jenny Luca and Jackie Gerstein, trying to provide a place for students to pursue educational interests outside of their traditional classroom. Lots of fun emanating largely from Australia. Uh, Jenny Luke is doing a session at 2 in the morning, my time, so I won't be there, but she's trying to provide leadership to students on Web 2.0 tools. The Saturday before the ISTE conference, the big ISTE conference at the end of June, we are having again our annual EduBloggerCon, the free unconference around social media and education. Do go to EduBloggerCon.com. Feel free to sign up. It is free. You don't even have to sign up to come. You can. You can arrive at the door and we'll welcome you. That same day, for the first time, our Open Source Con, also a free unconference on open source software in K-12 education. Thanks to ISTE for both of those. We've just announced a global education conference, an online, free online, multiple time zone, multiple language, multiple track conference on global education. This should really be fun. November 15th to 19th, 2010. Information is out. Go to globaleducationconference.com. Feel free to sign up and let us know you'd like to speak or volunteer or just stay informed. We announced this last week and had over 1,200 people sign up already, so we're very excited about it. If this is your first time in Illuminate, this is a participative environment. With the numbers that we have in the room tonight, I'm going to suggest you go up to View Layouts and select the Wide Layout. It makes it a little bit easier to see the chat. At the bottom of your participant window, you'll see some ways of communicating how you're feeling, a smiley face, a clapping hand confused look or a thumbs down. When we get to Q&A, you can also raise your hand using that hand with the green up arrow. That lets us know you want to take the microphone. And if you'd like to take the microphone, please do go up to Tools Audio and run the Audio Setup Wizard to make sure your mic is configured correctly. Here's your first chance to participate. Look for the wand with the red star at the end and then click on the map. And I know we have Peru. There you are. Coming up quickly. Feel free to also shout out in the chat where you're listening from, maybe what the time and temperature are. Two in South America, Australia, three in South America. Wherever you are listening from, looks like Portugal maybe. We're sure glad to have you here. Appreciate your being here. If you're listening to the recording, thanks for doing that. going to move us forward. So Charles, you actually proposed this session to me and I was delighted that you had. Uh, I, this had kind of been on my mind, but I hadn't really um, been specific about it. So I'm really appreciative that you took that initiative uh, and I'm going to turn things over to you. Oh, thank you very much, Steve. 
Um, this is something I've actually discussed with the American Architectural Foundation uh, a few months ago, and I got sick the day I was supposed to present in New York, so I was I really missed out on presenting all of this. And you gave me a, an opportunity here, so thank you very much, and hello everyone. I'm glad you're all here. Um, first of all, a quick show of hands. How many of you consider themselves reasonably to very familiar with what we mean by 21st century skills? Click on the hand raising icon. Not bad. About uh, 30, almost 30 out of 54, or past 30. Okay. Hmm. Not a bad number. But uh, for those of you who are not, have no fear, I will do an accelerated version of um, what we mean by all of that. And of course, to go and focus specifically on the architectural aspects of this. You'll see why in a moment. So with that uh, sound check, Steve, everything is uh, fine on the audio side? You sound terrific to me. OK, let's keep going. So what we're going to be discussing uh, are, is the following. First, what are the 21st century skills we're talking about? What the implications are in terms of uh, classroom pedagogy? And then what does this mean in terms of school architecture? And we're going to talk about that throughout uh, and more specifically as well at the end. So first of all, uh, realize that the movement for 21st century skills stems from requirements from employers that uh, you survey the world over. In this case, this was done by the conference board in the US. But wherever you talk to employers and you ask them, what um, would you like students to be prepared for, they invariably come back with not only knowledge, but skills as well, saying, yes, we do want them to know math and science and language and so on, but we also want them to be able to apply that knowledge. Apply it meaning think critically, communicate it, collaborate, and on and on. Realize that the old compact between employers and employees has fallen apart given the fluidity of job markets nowadays. And so Particularly in light of global competition, it is unlikely that an employer can take the time to shape, uh, to, uh, to teach an employee skills over the first two to five years of their career. So everyone is expecting the students not only to be good engineers, but also to know how to communicate their ideas and so on. With that, um, comes a, a view from the OECD that's also very active in this domain, particularly through the PISA efforts, where they have, um, where Andreas Schreiker there has uh, summarized the views of what the attributes of uh, good performers would be. So they would be collaborators, orchestrators, they'd be synthesizers. Actually, let, let me dwell on synthesizers for a second. We're all very familiar, of course, with the needs, the requirements for analytical minds. One thing that we do not pay attention to enough is that we're going to also need people who know how to synthesize the tons of information that is available on a global basis. And that synthetic skill is going to be at least as valuable as analytical skills. People who know how to take that synthesis and explain it in words that resonate with general audiences. People who are versatile enough to go from one discipline to another and to feel reasonably comfortable with a range of them, become experts rather rapidly. People who are great personalizers of events and, and information, and people who can localize to languages and local tastes and content. Uh, now, the OECD has missed out on one uh, attribute that I consider absolutely necessary, which would be innovation. So those who can not just imagine, but also create, and more importantly, innovate, meaning closing the loop from the ideation on one side all the way to productization, and I mean that in a, in a broad sense, on the other side. 
So the Partnership for 21st Century Skills, which is an organization started by Cisco and a few others seven years ago, has come up with this rainbow to describe what we would like to see happen in terms of student outcomes and underneath the rainbow that represents the outcomes, you see support systems that need to be put in place. So let me describe all of this. Core subjects are still necessary. It's a false dichotomy to think that it would be knowledge or skills. It is really knowledge and skills. Better, it is knowledge better acquired through skills, meaning the application of knowledge helps to solidify the acquisition of the knowledge. In addition to traditional topics, we're also asking for what we call 21st century themes, meaning interdisciplinary themes that will thread through a number of subjects. For instance, personal finance, which would take mathematics, sociology, and history, and make a coherent ensemble for the student to learn. Now, on top of that traditional content, you will also see that we're asking for life and career skills, learning and innovation skills, and information, information media and technology skills to be taught. And I'm going to review in a moment what all of this means. Now, for all of this to take place, we need to change the system. We need to change all of the elements of the support systems, meaning standards and assessments have to be revamped to allow for all of this to happen tops down. Curriculum and instruction in the classroom has to change. Professional development needs to be improved so that teachers know what to do. And of course, the learning environments have to be adapted. And I've circled curriculum instruction and learning environments because we will be going over those two areas in more detail. Interestingly, if you ask students, how would you prefer to learn? You do not get technology ranking as number one. You, it's only ranking as number four. What you do see is number one and number three learning socially in groups with friends. So somehow we have not erased a million years of evolution with 20 years of technology. Interestingly, also note number two. They would like to be doing practical things. So I'm going to harp on those two words. They want constructivist learning, they want to do, and they want to do things that are practical, that are relevant to their world, so that they do not disconnect, they stay engaged. And I'll let you savor this little uh, cartoon. Yes, making the point that even as young as four-year-olds want to know why, I'm sure you can all, we can all relate to those moments in the class thinking, why do I need to know this? Just tell me why, please, so I stay involved. So, the 21st Century Skills Framework is as is described here, meaning the core subjects are listed and the themes are listed as well. You see that the themes represent topics such as global awareness, financial literacy, civic literacy, health, environmental literacy. Obviously, each locality, country, province, state, whatever, can add or subtract their own. These are recommended, not mandatory. Now, here's an example of how a green school could help the acquisition of global awareness, financial literacy, environmental literacy, health, and civic literacies as well. The school building can be an example of the best practices, such as food and drink, right? The cafeteria itself, the food that's grown on premises, energy and water, the temperature controls in the building, as well as the water systems, travel and traffic, how how does how does the, the the flood occur during recess and through what patterns? How are the cars with parents dropping kids off or buses? How does it all all that operate? What are the queuing mechanisms, the timing mechanisms, and so on? Purchasing and waste. How does this all come in to the building and out of the building? 
how do we take care of the grounds? How do we take care of the buildings themselves? What is the architecture behind the buildings themselves? And then as you broaden those circles, what's the inclusion and participation you can think of um, in terms of uh, community and in terms of uh, global neighborhoods? You know, are you connecting to that class in Russia or China? Are you connecting with the seniors locally? Are you seeing um, lifelong learners, your own parents, on the school grounds after hours? So when we talk about skills, it is really about knowledge and skills. I'm listing here the skills that the P21 movement has recommended be paid attention to. And I'll give you a few seconds to read them. Now here's a very simple mnemonic way for you to, to remember all of this. Uh, at least for those of you who are in the US, you know that uh, we use this uh, um, this uh, um, moniker called the three R's to describe the traditional subjects. And by three R's, we mean reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, for those of you outside the US, it's almost uh, hard to explain given that only one word out of three starts with an R. But just bear with me. Well, similarly to the three R's, we describe all of this by the four C's, so communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity are a proxy to all of the other skills. So you can say that we're trying to fuse the three R's and the four C's. That's a quick way for you to remember uh, what we're talking about here and to describe it to others, because one of your roles, obviously, will be to propagate this knowledge. Now, if I may editorialize a little bit on some of these things, it will also depend on, on which country you're in, which ones you're going to be paying more attention to. For instance, when I present in France, I tell French society that it's not exactly flexible and adaptable as American society is. And so perhaps it needs to make a bit more of an effort there. Um, conversely, when I um, present in this country, I remind people that uh, we certainly could have used more critical thinking um, in during the past administration, for instance, or on a range of issues. And so each country has its pluses and minuses, its strengths and weaknesses, and will decide from this list what uh, aspects to focus on most. A lot of this is described in, in uh, the book that Bernie Trilling at uh, the Oracle Foundation and I co-authored. And I don't want to be redundant here. Uh, you'll have uh, the latitude to go to the website. I encourage you to look at the media tab and look at the videos we have of excellent examples from a number of school systems showing how they do, uh, they, how they teach skills through projects, how they assess them, and so on. We were very pleased to get the endorsement from uh, uh, Paul Revel, our Secretary of Education here in Massachusetts, uh, as well as a number of people across a variety of, uh, of pretty much all walks of life. Now, just so you know, uh, more than 50% of the proce proceeds of the author's royalties go to nonprofits. So this is not meant to be a money-making operation. It's meant to propagate the mission. So now let's talk about what happens due to all of this. How does this affect curriculum instruction, and how does the school architecture need to adapt? Well, one simple um, consequence is that if you want to teach skills, and if you want to engage the learner via relevant activities, clearly you're no longer going to be able to use merely didactic approaches of lecturing and doing projects very infrequently, if at all you will be led to do a lot more projects and use direct instruction to provide context and do the core activities via projects. And by projects, I really mean in a broad sense, designs, inquiries, simulations, problems, and so on. 
which means that the traditional environment where people are simply sitting in rows listening passively is no longer adequate. Actually, it was not adequate even during our days. But for some reason, we went from a very fluid and project-like environment during elementary school to a rather disciplinarian and auditory-only environment in middle and high school. And that has served us reasonably well for 200 years through the Industrial Revolution and the Information Revolution, but at this point it has become completely inadequate. So we're looking for different attributes. We're looking for environments where the presenter takes center stage, not necessarily the teacher. The teacher goes from being a lecturer to being a storyteller, an orchestrator, and a leader. We may have other learning facilitators there as well, experts from industry, both live and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, live physically or live um, electronically. We would have quiet areas. We would have immersive areas. We would have group rooms and solo spaces. We would have still lectures. We would have centers of activities. We would have access from home 24 by 7 by 365. We would have flexible furniture. And one question I will pose to you, because I'm certainly by no means an architect, how do we deal with visual clutter? Um, be it furniture or simply being all the things that people post on the walls. And so if you, if you think it through, you realize that uh, a better architecture would be even within the confines of the traditional school with its walls and classroom and so on. The ability to use flexible partitions and flexible furniture with moving things around, little groups working here and there, presenting, etc., using a variety of technologies and techniques to collaborate and work through projects. There is plenty being done. I would recommend you take a look at some of these sources here and they will describe various projects happening. A lot has been done in the UK in particular on this topic. And with that, I conclude this uh, short presentation and I'm open to your questions. Thanks, Charles. This is really an interesting topic. It looks like Chuck has the first hand up, and I believe, Chuck, you're looking at doing some work yourself. So I'm going to give you the mic. Here's how it works. To, to ask for the mic, raise your hand, the hand with the green up arrow. And then I will click on and give you microphone permissions. And then you need to click on the large microphone icon in the audio area. So that's what you do, Chuck. It's a, like a toggle switch. It will turn your mic on now. My mic should be on. We're hearing you loud and clear. clear. Excellent. Uh, Charles, thank you very much for the presentation. My school is a K-12 through charter school located outside Pennsylvania, and we've recently purchased an old industrial site that we're looking to convert into our new campus. The thing that I'm concerned about is how to differentiate between um, I guess for lack of a better term, what might be called fads in educational design and the physical space compared to research-driven, solid um, design structures that will last us you know, well into this century. Chuck, would you please clarify? Oh, there's an echo. I've turned Chuck's mic off while you're talking. Chuck, you'll have to turn it back on to respond. OK. Uh, if you could please clarify one thing. When you mean fads in education, do you mean from a pedagogical standpoint? Or uh, or are you, were you referring to architectural fads? Sorry, Chuck. You'll need to turn your mic back on. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the chance to clarify. And then architectural fads. Um, I guess the one example that's jumping to mind primarily is the concept of the open classroom, um, which while I did not participate in that movement, 
my best understanding from folks that did is that it was not a very successful idea once it was actually implemented. So we have essentially two large rectangles that we can do more or less what we want with and in the process of going through design charrettes and uh, working with architects to try to conceive the space and to put our own personal stamp on it, we also want to make sure that we are incorporating um, the best research and knowledge in learning design from a physical space and an architectural standpoint into this more or less blank slate of a building. Thank you for clarifying. So, um, I'm not an architect by any stretch. Uh, however, I still I do believe though that form follows function, and so what you're describing in terms of um, uh, failed experiments of probably the 80s and, and perhaps even before relates to projects having got, gotten themselves a bad reputation because projects were done in a very unstructured way and it wasn't necessarily the concept of project that was faulty, it was the implementation of projects was, that was faulty. And of course with that the open classroom aspects that came for the facilitation of projects. So we advocate that people get, teachers get trained via school, uh, schools of education but also by themselves by, uh, for instance, taking material from the Buck Institute for Education, BIE.org, uh, look at their uh, project learning materials, learn how to do good projects and not necessarily confuse um, open classrooms with chaos. Uh, a project is a structured activity even if it's an, it's an alive one because the students are not simply sitting at their desks uh, falling asleep. So uh, Chuck, I do believe that as teachers learn or relearn how to do projects, that will necessarily imply a, a more open classroom uh, uh, form that you'll have to accommodate for. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and give the mic to Fio. Go ahead, Fio. Thank you. <clears throat> the, uh, the aspect I'd like to <clears throat> focus on is collaboration. And that is because I teach uh, developmental education students wh whose average age is 24 to 44. And uh, the emphasis of students and teachers being more collaborative uh, doesn't work. Uh, the teacher has to be show that they've got the leadership. The teacher has to be able to be there to have the expertise to guide the students into and through a maze of learning. And this question about architecture and the open classrooms not being um, implemented well to me is a counterpoint to the question of collaboration where if teachers think all they have to do is gather the students and say okay uh, go for it and um, I'm here if you need me to collaborate with you we're going to have lost students who fall through the cracks because many of them will not say I'm lost so the question of collaboration is one that I want to focus on that we implement well just like we do that architecture. Um, absolutely, Theo. This is, uh, this is something that's uh, part of learning how to do projects the proper way. So uh, it's, it's, a bit, uh, it's a bit like uh, the, uh, the trick of uh, spinning plates at the, at the top of sticks, right? The, the teacher has to come uh, periodically to the working groups and give them a little bit of a spin, be there to guide them, not necessarily to pre-chew, pre-digest solutions, but to guide them. Uh, there, is, there is an active role to play by the teacher. Again, that's where uh, some of the, the projects of uh, the 70s and 80s got a bad rap because it was just a free-for-all with no guidance. Not only does the teacher have to teach them how to get to learn the content, but they also have to be uh, capable of teaching them how to collaborate better, how to listen to each other, for instance how to value diverse opinions uh, from, from people who have diverse ethnic uh, and cultural backgrounds. 
and on and on. So the art of collaboration, the art of joint uh, uh, um, brainstorming, how do you do brainstorming without squashing creativity, um, and on, et cetera, how to communicate clearly between yourselves as a team and with the other teams, how to present your case, et cetera, et cetera. All the skills have a certain uh, knowledge component intrinsically that needs to be taught by the teacher as the students do the content-based projects. So I, I completely agree with you. Um, all of these aspects need to be uh, really thought through by the, the, the teacher and the education community. And then, of course, the architecture is there to facilitate uh, the process. Yes, and on uh, that wonderful chart you showed us, or image, and it had professional development, um, that's where this piece, I think, has to come in, where the teacher develops the art of making sure that no student is left behind while other students are you know, driving ahead and also seeing when the whole group um, have come to a stall or all of a sudden there's no more energy and how to re-energize and take the lead. So thank you. I think there's uh, a lot in professional development that will address this that you showed in your chart. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Charles, so I have a question. You've talked about the uh, pedagogy and you've talked about the structure that would support that in the classroom. What about the methodology of getting to the structure? Is there a degree to which uh, the process of actually creating the structure and the architecture is something that in a very healthy environment would be undertaken by those who are going to be there? Well, um, any, any new building is a big endeavor for a district. Right? Right. I mean, it's it's uh, millions of dollars, it's bonds, it's uh, parents' involvement, painful discussions about uh, what to do, how to prioritize, and so on. But you don't always have a clean slate. So very often, you have to retrofit existing buildings, right? And and the, the vast majority of uh, situations is existing buildings. So let's differentiate uh, those two cases as we answer the question. In the case of existing buildings, you do have the existing walls, and you're stuck with that to a certain extent, uh, particularly in places where there's asbestos and other hazards to deal with. So by and large, you have a certain footprint, and you have to live with the footprint. And as you know, interior designers can be really good at optimizing space. And that has to be uh, obviously a, a different exercise than when you're designing from scratch. And then you can think of uh, uh, passageways and uh, open vistas and so on, collaborative spaces and so on, in a completely different way. So these are the, 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 two, the two situations you'd encounter. So I find that kind of intriguing, because I understand that logic, and yet at the same time, it feels as though the process in, it, in and of itself isn't participatory and as collaborative as the environment we're hoping it will create. And maybe that's just an inherent difficulty. Well, I mean, it depends on the leadership, the local leadership, right? If typically the local leadership will be, um, will be soliciting input from the teaching community, from the parents, et cetera, and the students themselves, uh, obviously, the architects now uh, have uh, a lot of experience uh, from what they have witnessed worldwide, particularly in the US and the UK. So there are plenty of models to follow. They can see what has worked, what hasn't. Uh, perhaps what um, we haven't seen quite as much of is the link between psychology research and architectural design. I'm not particularly uh, aware of that causal linkage done really well, except for the, the courses, the experiments, you know, things such as lighting uh, and so on, which did back to the 30s. Uh, but there, you know, the, the correlation, for example, between visual clutter um, and learning environments. I've always wondered, is it good to have all the walls of a classroom plastered with a myriad of things, or should we have less clutter? I personally uh, am a fan of Scandinavian designs with clean lines, 
but that may be the way my brain functions. But then again, perhaps I am the lowest common denominator in terms of clutter. Now, all this to say that this is, this is a, a decision that all, all of these smaller things have to be thought through with help from people who will be actually using the the spaces. So we lost the question that was up there, and I'm um, oh there, there we go, Mike. So Mike, I'm giving you the mic. And to turn your microphone on, Mike, you click the larger microphone button down in the audio box. There you go. There you go. Hey, thank you very much. Um, Charles, first of all, excellent book. I've read it several times. I had I had the wonderful experience of going out to Napa and seeing how they had redesigned that school. And, and I was awestruck, not at just the redesign, because it was a business-like atmosphere. But what really impressed me, I was expecting to see all this technology. What I saw was a culture of learning that was just incredible. One question I do have, as I saw that and as I talked with the kids out there, what ideas of assessment do you have in trying to assess these 21st century skills? Uh, and also keeping the assessment up on the 21st century level, but while also maintaining um, the standardized test that we have to make sure all the kids are passing at the same time. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. So clearly we have a dichotomy to live with for a little while here. Uh, we have standardized tests, and although one of our aspirations is that the standardized tests be completely uh, revamped and vastly improved, we are still advocates of keeping uh, summative assessment mechanisms in place. We are not saying summative assessments are bad, only formative assessments should be used. We're saying poor summative assessments are bad, you know, particularly multiple choice ones. So um, first of all, we'd like to state unequivocally that we'd like summative assessments to be improved. Second, in today's world, uh, yes, they're here to stay, and they provide a certain measurement baseline that people need. States, governments, and so on, everybody, uh, universities, everybody needs some form of um, objective, quote unquote, um, methods to to rank the various uh, students. That said, we also assume that over the coming years we're going to see a lot more portfolios and a lot more uh, measurements of the whole child, all the various aptitudes rather than strictly the academic aptitudes. We are seeing, and you can find that on, um, on the book's DVD as well as on the book's website, there are assessment techniques being used today in the classroom by the teachers who are doing those projects. Now, there is, of course, a limit to how much you can do this in the presence of state-mandated tests. Um, these tests are here. They're relatively, well, they're more or less OK, depending on which state you live in. But they are, they have to be passed. And that's why a lot of the work I do is at the state, province, and country level, because unless we do provide this air cover where we do change the systems at the, at the standards level and then cascade that into more sophisticated assessments, there's only so much that the teachers can do uh, to, to go beyond what's required. Now, that said, there's a piece of research that's ongoing right now where I'm taking uh, the schools that were documented in the book, and we're going to the next step trying to document their best practices, uh, not just in terms of project, but also in terms of assessment, as well as see if we can document what results they are getting in traditional tests. And I'm hoping we can find and we can show that, lo and behold, even if they're te teaching through skills, or perhaps because they're teaching through skills, they're getting better results on summative state tests than kids from the same socioeconomic strata. So stay tuned. Hopefully, I'll have that research available by early fall. So I'm, I'm going to go back to my question before, because I, I'm thinking that the big picture schools were in part uh, collaboratively designed with the local educators. Have there been examples
examples where uh, that the process of actually structuring the schools, is, the creation of the school space, has either been driven by the administrators and the and the local community, and or have there been examples where the building structure is is created in such a way as to allow restructuring by uh, the particular. Uh, the, the teachers who are teaching at, that, at any particular given point in time? Uh, yes and yes. I can think of two examples. Uh, Crossways Academy in the UK and Charles County Public Schools uh, in Maryland. Uh, both of them have had very participatory environments uh, where not, it was not just the superintendents working with the architect's firm, but the teachers, the students, the community at large participated as well. Fascinating. Okay, I haven't been able to follow if there have been any questions in the chat that haven't been answered, but I hope that you will raise your hand if there is something that you wanted to have answered that didn't get answered. Uh, I did put in the links from Charles's slide with all the references, uh, and that's back in the chat, and will of course be uh, in the chat log, which gets published as well as in the recording. Did anybody else want to ask a question? You can use the hand. There we go. SD1, I'm giving you the mic. To turn your mic on, you click on the large. There you go. Yes, hello. Um, I was wanting to um, see, uh, hear a little bit more about your vision of the actual hardware that would be in an open classroom. Um, specifically, do you think there would have to be one-to-one -one computing uh, for it to be a truly collaborative effort and project-based environment? Um, also, with the furniture you mentioned, um, flexible furniture. So I was wanting to see if you've seen actual environments where you felt like it really clicked and it worked, or what's possibly some designs that you've seen that haven't actually been realized. Well, uh, first of all, my position about one-to-one uh, -one, uh, laptops is uh, that it's an aspiration goal eventually, and it is not uh, something that is affordable by pretty much most environments nowadays. Second, even if it was affordable, we do not necessarily have teacher development, we do not necessarily have content, uh, and we don't necessarily have pedagogical models on how to best use them. So what we do find is one-to-one -one laptop used for, at the bottom, to teach how to use basic applications like word processing, email, and so on and so forth. But that's a really a very basic application. We're, what we're still missing is teaching with technology and teaching through technology. And those two dimensions not necessarily require laptops per se. Teaching with technology could very mean, easily mean a GPS and a single laptop projecting a Google map, for instance, doing, during a geography class. It doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one ratio. And teaching through technology, same thing. You could have immersive environments that are video-centric, but not necessarily require computers, per se. Again, one-to-one -one laptops uh, end up being a rather diminutive view of uh, technology and a very expensive one at that. However, it happens to be good in developing countries where there isn't enough base of uh, students who are functional with um, basic computer applications. That's why you see OLPC, you know, one laptop per child being sold in places like Uruguay and Peru and, and, and so on. Uh, and second, even in the US or elsewhere, we find that to be somewhat politically expedient uh, f for uh, uh, politicians to buy laptops because it's something that is visible to the parents and gives an impression of modernity which uh, isn't necessarily to say that the kids will be doing particularly better on uh, either their learning at large or their test scores in particular, but it's something that allows politicians to claim victory. So uh, it is politically expedient more than it is pedagogically sound for the time being, nor, nor affordable. Uh, and unfortunately, that's the, that's the state of affairs. That, that's my personal opinion. I, obviously, working for a technology company, I am far from being a Luddite. However, I do like to see um, technologies used wisely. For instance, connecting 
the technologies to the, themselves, the students, and the students to the rest of the world makes a lot of sense. So high-speed internet access with lots of information flowing in, particularly bidirectional video, which we have been using in education for decades. Remember, we've been do, using video f as uh, tapes and reels and uh, VHS tapes and so on, um, and DVDs in a discrete format. And so the extension to streaming video is rather straightforward. So and what I'm trying to say is that there are some relatively slow varying technologies that can be used to a much greater um, pedagogical impact. And without the teaching difficulties that are brought by one-to-one -one ratios in particular. Charles, there was a question in the chat. I don't think it relates specifically to the architecture, but P. Garcia is asking, what part of the 21st century skills are being implemented while participating on EPALS projects? And I thought it might be interesting to actually look at the nature of um, global communication and or collaboration, virtual collaboration, and does that have an impact? Um, well, um, could you rephrase the question? I mean, I, I, I know what ePals is, but I'm not exactly sure uh, what is being asked here. Well, I think the question being asked by P. Garcia is the relationship between 21st century skills and a global participative project. Oh, I see. Well, there, there's two elements of, of it that come to mind immediately. The first one is obviously collaboration doesn't have to be within the confines of a physical classroom. So virtual collaboration is a skill to have, um, like we're doing here. Second, um, global awareness will go through linkages with um, systems such as ePals, where you, are, you get connected to, to uh, classrooms around the world. So you can, in a sense, help at least two of the skills and themes we talked about, first one being collaboration, the second one being global awareness. I would actually like to address one of the comments I saw in the chat, in the chatter, uh, about uh, the fact that um, the list of skills resembled what um, what people saw in Daniel's, Daniel Pink's book as well as what they saw in Tony Wagner's book. Um, well, regarding Tony Wagner, that's not surprising because uh, he worked with, uh, he, he got input from P21 as he was writing his book, and I was one of the endorsers of his book. So that's not surprising. Um, he came up with a slightly different framework, but we're all working for the same goals anyway. And, uh, you know, whether it's us or the OECD or so on, basically, by and large, we're saying the same things cut in different ways represented in different ways. What we tried to do was to come up at P21 with a framework that was actionable by uh, standards designers. So it had to be at the appropriate layer of granularity, a uh, layer of abstraction. It had to use a taxonomy that was understandable by everyone. It had to um, uh, to be uh, as as comprehensive as possible, but yet at the same time as succinct as possible, because you realize now you have to put into action a matrix of all these skills with the various subject areas. And so if you have too many skills, that becomes uh, unworkable for the standards designers. That's how we came up with that. As far as Daniel Pink is concerned, it's not quite the same um, uh, the same type of framework. Yes, obviously he's stressing uh, right brain activities, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the same uh, overall goals, uh, but with a different um, uh, lens on that. Chuck and PA, I've given you the mic again. Thank you. Am I coming through? Loud and clear. Loud and clear. Okay. The, the next question that I had was I was just wondering, Given that technology can develop at an extremely rapid rate, and as we move ourselves from an older building that we've leased to a new building that we get to design on our own, if there's a way to look at some of the trends in technology to see what might be more worthwhile uh, from a budgetary standpoint 
um, to encourage that participatory element uh, of using technology as a way to bring the students into the learning in a more action-oriented way. You talked about connection, high-speed internet, directional video. I'm just wondering if, if there's any kind of crystal ball that can be applied to any of that to see at least for the next three to five years what might be some of the more powerful trends or technologies that are uh, more likely to be a hit. Sure. Well, you know, one one uh, thing of I can disclose about my past is that I used to work in the semiconductor industry, um, and you know, in in micro in microchips, you know that thanks to Moore's law, we're seeing chip density double every 18 months, and the trend has not abated. We also know that storage density is doubling every 12 months, and bandwidth is doubling every nine months. So we have a hard time fathoming what that means because we're talking about geometric progressions, not linear progressions. And with these geometric progressions come the absolute inability to truly predict what is going to happen. What you can, however, predict is that it's really hard to keep up with that. So let me describe three areas, devices, file types, and applications. Devices first. Six months ago, you would have asked me about the Kindle. Today, you're asking me about the iPad. And a year ago, you'd have asked me about the iPhone or iPod. Prior to that, you might have wondered about the personal PlayStation or uh, an electronic whiteboard or whatever. Every six months, there's a new uh, device that comes on and captures everyone's imagination. There's no way one can keep up with the, the proliferation of devices. Second, the file types. We, we've gone from, let's say, just in, in, uh, in uh, text formats, we have to, to deal with the proliferation of uh, doc versions. You know, every three, four years, we're forced to a new office upgrade one way or another. We have to also contend with PDS. We have to contend with HTML, soon HTML5. We have to contend with X XML soon, et cetera. So the file types keep changing. And that's just, of course, for text and consorts. You could have the same with audio file types. You could have the same with video file types, and so on and so forth. Third, the applications. A few months ago, everyone was talking about Twitter. Before that, everyone was talking about Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. And with that, there's always new demands for educators to teach through these new mechanisms just because they're hot and they're out there. And no matter what, you're going to find a cool way to use something or another. But it's coming at such a fast rate that it's really not something that I believe we can keep track of and really be scientific about in terms of exploring all the various possibilities, doing um, uh, clear scientific studies, and then scale this up slowly through the classroom. So that's why I go back always to the relative invariance, the relative invariance being things that are multimodal, that are multimedia, and yet uh, are reasonably familiar to the environment, such as video, be it live or on demand. If there's one technology that I like particularly, it is the one we're using here. So whether it's Illuminate or WebEx or any of the similar technologies that allow you to do web conferencing um, with the ability to participate uh, in a joint session, those are great. Now, I would like to see all these systems give the ability to co-design, not just present or co-present. It's relatively, relatively difficult still to do co-designs via these technologies. And that's where I'd love to see real innovation take place. Again, it does sound as though you know, one of the conclusions is you have to be designing for knowing that things will change. And, uh, and certainly, handhelds and global collaboration and um, video conferencing and the like are, are likely to present all kinds of different requirements for how schoolwork gets done. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. 
Um, if I may also to ask, answer another question that's been asked um, in the chat window, what are the role of libraries and librarians? Quite essential, actually. Um, in a world where um, information is being more abundant by a, a factor of two than what we can actually capture and record, uh, their role is only amplified. Think of them as your extension, the people who are going to be able to go out there and find materials for your projects. They're going to become invaluable to you. Become the best, you know, befriend them, be their best friend. They will, uh, they will really help you out. Okay, we've got uh, time probably for one more question. Uh, Richard, before I give you the mic, Leonard did ask a couple of times, uh, Charles, he said, uh, you're not an architect and yet these are design concepts. Uh, where did you gain your design awareness and how would you propose that school boards and superintendents could shift their thinking in this way? Well, I merely read around. It's, uh, it's like you, Steve. You know, you just spend enough time with any topic in an open mind and you just to, you learn how to detect uh, good information from bad and synthesize it in a way that's uh, comprehensible to yourself and then share it with others. Richard, I've given you the microphone. To turn your microphone on, just click on the larger microphone icon in the audio area. Um, I just want to say thanks, Charles, for supporting libraries. We're in the process of planning and designing a new school for us, and the initial plans had no sign of a library at all. And I do believe it's quite popular in, in the US too to, to discover, uh, to design schools without libraries. One of our problems, and I did actually submit a, a submission to our Senate, no, I'm sorry, our House of Reps. Um, inquiry on libraries and librarians is there's no longer sufficient training places or even courses for training for teacher librarians. Thanks though for your support. You're most welcome. Okay, so Troy is asking again for your uh, website address, Charles, so if you don't mind putting that up, I'm going to move us to our closing slides here. I'm going to clap for you for uh, not only coming on tonight, but coming on as a second time guest uh, and recognizing you will be coming on again even um, on August 10th, the Neuroscience of Learning. And then on September 7th, if you're still so brave, on 21st Century Learning and STEM. So thanks, Charles, for being here tonight. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Steve, for this opportunity. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Hope you have a great night. Uh, the recording will be posted later tonight. I've been checking while we've been talking, and for some reason, the server is still down. So the full Illuminate recording will be at learncentral.org. The MP3 recording will have to wait till the server gets up, hopefully, tomorrow. So have a great night, and uh, see you online again. So Leonard, uh, if, there, if you would like some informal discussion, we can do that. Unfortunately, I have another engagement, so um, I think maybe that would make sense to try and pull that somewhere else. It certainly can be done in futureofeducation.com in a forum discussion. I know that uh, Greg was also offering a place for that to take place on his network. So Greg, if you want to, to do that, you're welcome to do so. There can be conversation also on the Learn Central recording. Um, I do have a couple of minutes. Uh, did you want to say anything in particular, Leonard? I can give you the mic. Good. Am I coming through? Loud and clear. Excellent. Well, actually, I didn't have anything else to add. It's just a wonderful presentation. And always very important to think about the design aspects of this. I had just mentioned in, in the chat that people should read John Dewey's classic, The School and Society, from 1899, where he provides a design for the elementary school. It's actually a graphic. His only graphic, I think, in his, in his entire work. What does and it look like? It, well, it, it has uh, a kind of a, a porous boundary between the school and the outside world, you know, the gardens and the fields and factories, workshops, whatever. Then in the school,
school, there are three basic zones. There are the practical areas around the periphery. So imagine a square, and these things, the workshop, the garden, the kitchen, the, uh, et cetera, are around the outside. And then there are, there are no classrooms in his school. There's what he calls the, um, the central, well, I don't remember what he calls it, but it's like the central consultation area. And the, the teachers set up the practical work, and then they are available for consultation. And when the students get consultation, they either go back to the practical area or into the library, which takes up about 50% of the whole room in the school. So they're either being shuttled for more information or shuttled back to the practical area to work. And it's just an amazing diagram. Fascinating. For somebody like me who hasn't read any Dewey ever, which I'm embarrassed to admit, is that the book to read? Well, it's the, it's the first great book because he lays out the whole problem. The problem is we've got this radically changed society. No, people don't work on farms anymore. They work in the cities. And the cities are very diverse. They're not, and it's 1899 Chicago. Uh, and so we have them in the, in the schools. OK, so, and we have all these new uh, applications in education around that are kind of ad hoc applications. Manual arts, uh, uh, drawing in the classrooms, nature study, et cetera. And so Dewey's asking, well, what are all these things about? And how can we kind of take these pieces and make a new kind of education out of them? And then in, this, in the uh, third part of the book, he actually, and it's a very short book, these are three lectures. In the third part of the book, he actually outlines and describes and draws what the school would look like. And it's, it's probably the best single book. It's very short and sweet. Just the first three chapters have to be read. The rest was just padding they threw in to sell a book. And uh, it gives the whole program. And I think we're in exactly the same place now. We have. Uh, a radically changed society. We have all these ad hoc developments, and we're trying to figure out ways of matching and mixing the pieces and getting a new synthesis going, and we need a new design. Fascinating. Leonard, I've received so many compliments on your session. Wow. Well, you got one from me. It was a great session. Oh, good. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, was, and uh, I'd like to pat you on the back as well. Wonderful. Well, Steve, you know, I don't do this to pat you on the back. I do it because this is such a treasure. I mean, it's it's the only meeting place I know where all of the people who are thinking actively about this are actually coming together, sharing ideas on a weekly and bi-weekly basis, uh, two times a week or whatever, and you have all of the voices in the conversation. It is just nothing like it. Well, I'm glad. It would, be, it would be great to figure out some way of institutionalizing it a bit more. Maybe having a conference or a small invited meeting of some of these people and actually feel their ideas, make it a kind of a working conference at the end of three days or something like that. They actually had some various pictures that could reach, if not a consensus, at least get a lot of um, support from a lot of the people. I mean, kind of moving the thing from individual voices and individual projects and bring some initial degree of convergence. You know, there are a lot of fun ways to think about that. You know, one that I continue to mention is my interest in creating some kind of a, uh, an education declaration. The yep. other would be to have local meetings. I'm a big proponent of local meetings yep. and to do kind of a town, you know, future of education town hall meetings where you have a structure for helping create dialogue that then the people hold, which isn't experts coming, but actually creating that opportunity for dialogue. And the one I thought of today was uh, going to all of the people who've participated so far and asking them to write two pages and producing a uh, an actual downloadable PDF called the future of education and have it update say quarterly with additional mm -hmm. material and having so that it can be kind of handed out and spread around. Well, you know, you could actually take that idea and leverage it with something like a Delphi design. So you have maybe a hundred people write out their own manifesto or their own best ideas based on all these conversations. And then that goes to a group that, that is selected, a small group of three or four people who try to make a uh, some kind of a synthesis of all of that. 
and then they send it back to those people for commentary on the synthesis. And I think you would actually end up with, maybe, of course, not consensus, but you'd end up with a, a lot of very high-powered ideas that have a lot of support. That would be almost like the Constitutional Convention. Uh, well, well, we, we could we, do it in Philadelphia. <laughs> that's right. We could do it at EDUCON. The, the, uh, interesting there would be if, it, if, if somebody might be willing to fund that. That would be fascinating. Well, we could talk about that. I mean, there's, uh, I, I don't know what the funding environment is right now. Having been retired for five years and no longer chasing dollars for grants, I'm kind of a little bit out of the loop. But something that you and I could talk about and other people could join one on, too. Yeah. I love the I love the conversation and I sure appreciate your being here. Okay, I'm gonna close this down just because I'm sorry I have another uh commitment, but thanks Leonard for taking the mic. Uh, most Can of I you know the you. drill. Absolutely. Most of you know the drill, you need to log out for the recording to process. And uh, we'll try and get that server fixed and get things posted up. Take care everybody, have a great night. <laughs>